on the 4th of July, Fred Leaf from the... Good luck saying that one. Schenectady Gazette. Good one. Nailed it. Yeah. I spoke of the USA's basketball tradition. <laughs> you can pronounce the name of the Gazette, but you can't, you can't continue with a normal sentence. I used up all of my Krenek. Krenek. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear oh well played now I'll start again just start after where you've uh, you've said Gazette I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina <laughs> I think it really helped him spectacular player from the beginning you could see right away Jordan was going to be a big time scorer and showed what an impact he was going to have on the league this is NB85 Celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan's rookie season in the NBA. And now, your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to the show, Aaron. Thanks again for joining me, mate, for the next installment of NB85. No worries, Ads. Thanks, mate. We are now at episode number three of our series, and it's been very enjoyable researching and moving through the 1984 calendar year and all that it included for Michael Jordan. But the knowledge that we have still yet to touch on his regular season debut as a bull and even the preseason games you know, excites me as I'm sure it would you a great deal. We have access to a number of his games from his rookie season and to be able to watch them and break them down here on NBA 85 is something that I'm really looking forward to. 1984 USA Pre-Olympic Exhibition Games. Now today We'll be chatting primarily about the nine-game pre-Olympic exhibition schedule that Team USA took part in once the mini-camp had ended in mid-June. They then took on uh, one alumni team, which was made up of Indiana University legends, including Isaiah Thomas, uh, of all people as well, which is a really interesting little wrinkle there. Team USA also took on an NBA-based team for a further eight games as well. So this period of time that we're talking about stretches from late June through to late July, just before the actual 1984 Olympic Games kicked off in Los Angeles. So it should be fun, mate. Yes, looking forward to it, mate. Let's just get straight into it. The first game of the schedule that USA had was on June the 22nd. They took on an Indiana University alumni team. The game was an absolute blowout, basically. The final score was 124-89. to On June the 23rd, mate, there was an article which was titled Olympic Cages Prove Team Skills with Victory Over Former Hoosiers. And I'll just quickly quote from that a bit because it does set up what this exhibition game was all about. It says, It was a homecoming, a send-off, and another step on the road in a bid for Olympic gold, and the US Olympic men's basketball team opened its exhibition schedule. Coach Bobby Knight, the man directing the team, sent his charges against an Indiana University alumni squad dominated by players who helped him win two NCAA basketball titles, a national invitational tournament, and seven Big Ten championships. So that sort of sets the stage for what this game would be. It was played at Assembly Hall in Bloomington, Indiana, which was the site of the Olympic trials back in April that we chatted about in episode one of NB85 as well. The Indiana team was actually made up of legends from the previous years who had played with Indiana University, and one of them, as I mentioned earlier, was Isaiah Thomas, but quite an array of players from past years and also a few that were actually part of that current Indiana team, and there's no irony lost on the fact that Bob Knight is obviously the current coach of Indiana, although he was at the helm for Team USA, so quite an interesting start to this exhibition schedule which I'm sure not many people would have probably known about prior. It was said that Bobby Knight tried to give each of the other 16 players equal playing time in the games and in the YouTube clip that I saw the other first three players mentioned during this first game against the Indiana alumni were actually the three players that were cut from the team uh, in Chuck Person, Lancaster Gordon and Tim McCormick. The Hoosier team had one afternoon to have a practice together, which may have explained the 124 to 89 final scoreline, while the, the US team, of course, had had the other trials together and had two-a-day practices the week leading up. Chris Mullen, who played for the US team, of course, uh, in the game, said that after playing each other so much in the trials, that it was a relief to play the Indiana alumni team for a change. 
couple of stats from the game, mate. We've been fortunate to be able to track down the box scores for each and every game. And I also want to give a quick shout out to a good mate of ours, Todd Spear, who has provided all the missing box scores that we actually needed to be able to chat about in this episode today. So thanks to Todd for that. A couple of the stats from this game, Michael Jordan was the leading scorer for the USA. He scored 16 points and he actually hit all seven of his field goal attempts. Chris Mullen was just behind him with 14 points and then Vern Fleming and Tim McCormick had 12 points apiece. And in terms of rebounding, Wayman Tisdale led the way for US with eight boards. And then just for Indiana University, Isaiah Thomas, who of course was a an upcoming star in the NBA at that stage, he was 7 of 12 from the field and scored... 17 points, along with Butch Carter of the Indiana Pacers and Kent Benson, who was with the Detroit Pistons in the NBA. He had seven boards for the Indiana University alumni team. Uh, There's a couple of other notable players. Quickly, I'll just touch on that were in the Indiana team. It included Quinn Buckner, who was with the Boston Celtics at that stage. Randy Whitman, who was then with the Atlanta Hawks. Now, another really interesting thing, which you would barely ever know about unless you happen to read the box score, the Van Arsdale brothers, Dick and Tom, and they were actually in their early 40s at this stage. They were on the roster, but I'm not sure if they actually got court time or not because it appeared they just had zero in terms of their stats across the board, at least what was reported. And then a player that you're very familiar with, mate, Uwe Blub, who was actually with the Indiana Hoosiers at that stage. He was also on this team too. There were 17 players on the squad for Indiana University and six of them were DNPs or at least they had no impact on the stat sheet whatsoever. The US team never trailed after they led 6-5 to in the first quarter and at halftime they were leading by a comfortable 20-point margin. So the game was never really in doubt after the opening 5-10 to minutes. 16 US players were still competing for the 12 available spots and as you were mentioning a little bit earlier, all played between 11 and 19 minutes based on what Bob Knight was currently trying with his roster rotation. Bobby Knight did use some of his former Indiana University players in practices against the US team and and that included Quinn Buckner in the lead up to this game as well. So some really quite interesting facts there. Uh, behind the scenes to do with his first of nine exhibition games, but the only one against a college-based or alumni team. Now, this is in no shape, way or form a direct reflection on how much attention I do or don't pay towards the other notes that you sent through to me, mate, but I had no idea that Tom and Dick Van Arsdale were actually in the game, which I think is, uh, is very cool. One of only two sets of twins to have ever played uh, in the NBA, along with Horace and Harvey Grant, of course. The the game had an attendance of 17,113, and 99.9% of the total exposure that I've had to Kent Benson has happened during the researching for this podcast, mate. I had barely heard of the guy up until this point. I'm glad that you paid attention to those notes that I sent through as well, mate, but it is good that you finally twigged on the fact that the Van Arsdale brothers were on the roster. But yeah, that is really cool, given the fact that um, they're in their early 40s at that stage, and I'm sure some of the Indiana faithful that were there in attendance would have loved to have seen them get some court time, and I'm sure they must have got some minutes, but based on the the fairly basic box scores that we had from the game, it appeared that they had no impact statistically, but still, just to be there would have been uh, quite a thrill, I'm sure, for all those in attendance You wanted to mention an article that you came across as well, mate? Yeah, on the 23rd of June, Greg Stoder uh, from the Star News wrote an article entitled Jordan Won't Overdose on Basketball. It said that the Chicago Bulls training camp was due to open three days after the Olympic Games and Rod Thorne, the GM for the Bulls, expressed concern that MJ might be, and I quote, basketballed out after his busy schedule of playing over the previous 12 months from playing in the Pan Am Games in 1983, the 1984 season at North Carolina and then the Olympic trials and the games themselves. But MJ said unless he's embroiled in a contract squabble of some description, he will be ready to go for camp on time. Dean Smith had toned down the idea of MJ becoming the next Magic Johnson or Julius Irving and said that he'd more likely to fill the mould of a city Moncrief. Now, they may have been understating 
Jordan's impact to lessen the pressure on Mike, but it also may have been Smith's own underestimation of MJ as an offensive player. It's well documented that Dean Smith is the only guy to ever hold MJ under 20 points per game. Jordan was spoken about as a great defender and almost as good of an offensive player at the time. The comparison of of Sidney Moncrief was because Moncrief was a better defender than offensive player as an all-star for the Milwaukee Bucks in the 1980s. Yeah, and not to underplay Moncrief as far as being an NBA player because he was a really effective and a great pro over a number of years too. So still a very good comparison. And as you're saying, you know Jordan hadn't fully blossomed his offensive game, but that certainly started to happen throughout the tail end of these exhibitions and uh, obviously well into the Olympics and beyond. So... On June the 28th, and we did mention this briefly in a previous episode, Bobby Knight finalised his 12-man Olympic roster by cutting Tim McCormick, who was with Michigan Wolverines, Chuck Person of Auburn, Lancaster Gordon from Louisville, and Johnny Dawkins of Duke. Chuck Person and Johnny Dawkins remained as alternates in case of injury or whatever else may have come up in the lead-up to the games themselves, so they still travelled with the team. There was an article from the Argus Press on the 28th of June, titled Olympic Cage Squad Finalized, US coach Bobby Knight said that, I don't know if I've done anything as personally difficult, not just in selecting the final 12, but also making the announcement of the other final squad. Boston Celtics legend John Havlicek said of the NBA players that were to play in the upcoming exhibitions that these guys, being the Olympians are coming to look for your jobs in a couple of months and they will be able to embarrass you. The NBA team for the first exhibition was Reggie Theus, Rick Mahorn, Gus Williams, John Bagley, Terry Cummings, Michael Ray Richardson, Orlando Woolridge and Gerald Henderson. Obviously it only took one exhibition game for Bobby Knight to be secure of who his final 12-man squad was going to be so he quickly put an end to that because he actually had up until a mid-July cutoff date to nominate his final 12 players so he was obviously uh, steadfast with his choices that leads us nicely into the second game of the exhibition schedule the first against the NBA stars as you mentioned the second game was taking place at the Providence Civic Center in Providence Rhode Island John Havlicek was one of the coaches for the NBA team along with Paul Silas they were the I guess, head coach, assistant coach sort of combo for the NBA All-Stars. Now, it must be said that the NBA teams that were presented over the following eight games were quite an eclectic mix. They were dubbed NBA All-Stars or NBA Stars in most of the documents that I've found throughout the research side of things and some of the TV telecasts of games that were aired. But you'd have to say that some were local players and players from the regional areas that might have been of particular interest as well. So we'll touch on those as well throughout the following games that we recap. Uh, Just quickly, in this game, the US were comfortable winners. It was 128 to 106. Michael Jordan and Chris Mullen were the equal leading scorers for Team USA with 16 points apiece. And Chris Mullen really caught fire in the third quarter of this game and went 8 for 11. Got all 16 of his points in that quarter. Sam Perkins had 15 and Alvin Robertson had 14 points. Just for the NBA players, Terry Cummings of the then San Diego Clippers had 25 points. Gus Williams from the Washington Bullets had 19. Orlando Woolridge of the Chicago Bulls had 17 points. And Reggie Theus of the Kansas City Kings scored 14. In various newspaper articles, Bobby Knight said that the game versus the NBA All-Stars would be an opportune time for him to determine the role players for Team USA when they got to the Olympics proper. In this first game, some of the NBA players hadn't been in a game at all since before the playoffs had started on April 17, which was over nine weeks prior to this game. And it showed in the Olympic team, smacked them on the boards with an advantage of 55 to 37 and in an assist advantage of 36 to 16. During the games against the NBA squads, there was actually a no foul out rule, which I found interesting and and it was said that the NBA guys were, and I quote, clubbing the Olympic kids. So that was interesting. It was and in one of the articles, um, I don't know which one it was, but it mentioned that one of the players, I think it was in the game that was played in Milwaukee and we'll get to that later on in this chat, 
one of the guys had like 13 fouls <laughs> against him or something at one stage. And then at, at that particular point, one of the coaches actually twigged that they couldn't foul out. So I thought that was quite amusing as well. The third game of the exhibition schedule took place on July the 1st. And this one was a much closer affair. It was held at the Metrodome in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Team USA advanced to a 3-0 and record by defeating the NBA Stars 94-90. to So a much closer game. This time, big smooth, long-armed Sam Perkins led the USA with 16 points. And for the NBA Stars, we've got a really good lineup this time around. Kevin McHale of Boston had 18 points. Isaiah Thomas now with the NBA team, of course, who was with the Detroit Pistons. He scored 15 of his own points. And then Dan Ranfield, again of Detroit, and Randy Brewer from Milwaukee at the time, each had 13 points apiece. We should note as well that Magic Johnson from the Lakers and Mark Aguirre of the Dallas Mavericks also played for the NBA All-Stars on this team. So a much closer game and a really good tryout for Team USA in terms of at least what would be coming their way at the Olympics in terms of pressure. I'm convinced that due to the fact it was 1984 that the only reason that Randy Brewer had any profile in the NBA was because he was 7 feet 4, I swear. It must have been. Yeah. And also, I think that follows on as well from perhaps in some of these areas that they played regionally, the players on this NBA squad actually had links to that that area and that region, so I think they might have got the nod ahead of a couple of other players who I'm sure could have ably fitted the bill. And when questioned about how hard that the NBA players were playing against the Olympians, Kevin McHale said that the Olympic squad weren't going against a bunch of cupcakes in the NBA players. He also said that if the NBA players had a week together that we could beat them, such confidence and comments from Kevin McHale definitely didn't come as a surprise after some of the other stories that that you've heard over the years of his trash talking exploits. The NBA players all said that they put patriotism aside and wanted to win the game. Yep. Now, in an article that followed the next day, July the 2nd, it was titled USA Cages Shaping Up. It's got a good quote. It hit me early, seeing the NBA stars, Jordan said. We let them intimidate us with their status. Every once in a while, I dreamed about playing against these guys, but right now, I have to concentrate on the Olympics. And that's an interesting comment in itself from Jordan because he obviously was a big fan of Magic Johnson and the LA Lakers at this time as well. He really ideally wanted to play with the Lakers early on in his career when he was talking about possibly going pro. And of course, that wasn't going to happen based on how strong the Lakers team was at that particular time. And then just one other thing to note, on the same day, another article which was entitled Ewing Hears the Cheers said that the designation of uniform numbers had been done alphabetically. I'd always wondered prior to our research beginning for this whole project, mate, how the numbers came about because we know that Jordan was famously number nine for Team USA, but it was nothing more than an actual alphabetical order, which I found surprising and equal parts pretty cool to learn the behind the scenes of actually how those numbers were assigned. Yeah, I thought it was very cool and I hope you enjoyed telling the other listeners about that as I was looking forward to uh, to putting that across as one of the cooler points uh, which I I discovered in in my research. So I'm stuck with the uh, the supplementary of the other team dressing room stalls and also roommate allocations were also chosen alphabetically as per the players' surnames. I apologize for stealing your thunder, but it's on the run sheet. So I thought it was on there first. We'd go with mine. <laughs> and as I put together the other run sheet, <laughs> you know, you're welcome, mate. <laughs> the article also said that academic responsibility didn't allow Patrick Ewing to play in the Pan Am Games in 1983. An interesting fact was the hard floors in Bloomington during the, the trials in 1984 weren't great on his knees and actually affected his performance, which forced him to sit more than he would have liked, which I found interesting. The other title was Ewing Hear the Cheers, and it spoke of Ewing hearing the cheers of the US fans instead of the boos he hears when he plays for the Georgetown Hoyers. On the 4th of July, Fred Leaf from the... Good luck saying that one. Schenectady Gazette. Good one. Nailed it. Yeah. I spoke of the USA's basketball tradition. <laughs> <laughs> you can pronounce the name of the Gazette, but, <laughs> but you, can't, you can't continue with a normal sentence. I used up all of my Krennic. <laughs> 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 
Oh, dear. Oh, well played. No, I'll start again. Just start after where you've, uh, you've said Gazette. It was entitled USA's Basketball Tradition Online When Olympic Competition Commences. It said that the days of easy pickings are over despite the US being hot favourites. In 1960, they won by an average of 40 points per game. So they were suggesting that those days of the blowout wins may be over and it turned out that they ended up winning by a margin of only 32 points per game in 1984. Yeah, they dropped the ball a bit and uh, the world was starting to catch up, but obviously not nearly enough because USA totally dominated en route to the Olympic gold. This is NB85. Now let's get to the fourth game made in the exhibition series. The USA were 3-0 and heading into Carver Hawkeye Arena in Iowa City, Iowa, and they were taking on another team of NBA All Stars, and they this time had a 13 point winning margin. It was 92 to 79. It was played on July the 8th. Now, this time for USA, just to show you the balanced scoring attack they had, Alvin Robertson had 17 points. Michael Jordan and Chris Mullen had 16 points apiece, and then Wayman Tisdale, the Oklahoma Sooner star, he pulled down nine rebounds as well. A great balanced attack there from the US right across the board. For the NBA players, the leading scorer was Phil Hubbard, who was with the Cleveland Cavaliers at that stage. He had 15 points. And then a name that most people will be familiar with, Kelly Trapuka, who was with the Detroit Pistons. He had 11 points. And we've got Big Red, the redhead, Bill Walton. He had nine rebounds and five assists. Now, this game is actually one of the ones that I have on DVD. And I watched this in preparation for our chat today. And I must say, Bill Walton was terribly underrated as a passer. I know he probably still does get quite a few props for it, but he was really great, not just on the outlet pass, but he had a really good presence of mind to thread the needle with numerous passes and and he waited for the right cut at the right time and just had some great awareness on court. So I must make mention of that as well. In my opinion, his career in between 1977 when the uh, the Trailblazers won that much spoken about title, the only one in franchise history, in between that and the 85-86 85-86 season when he played with that great great Boston Celtics teams. His career goes into a bit of a black hole. I didn't really know a tremendous amount about it uh, up until you know, ha- having spent some time researching for the podcast, Adam. Yeah, he had a lot of injury worries and he had troubles with his feet as well, which was unfortunately foreshadowing what would then happen in future. You'd have guys like Sam Bowie, uh, Greg Oden, of course, they're the two most notable ones that come to mind, who would also be plagued by foot or leg related issues which unfortunately derailed their careers at different times as well so yeah that was a major thing that held him back even in this game as well actually the commentators made mention on numerous occasions how Walton was still trying to recover from all kinds of issues to do with his feet Uh, disappointing that it really restricted how great of a player he was because he was really an incredible guy and obviously a, a linchpin on that 1986 Celtics team as well off the bench too a couple of quick stats from this fourth exhibition game. The USA were leading 43-42 to 42 at the first half break, and then they ended up opening the game up in the second half. Don Nelson was the coach of the NBA All-Stars. Can't confirm or deny if he was wearing a fish tie or not. Just one other thing, when I was watching the game as well, one of the commentators, his name was Don Cricky, which I haven't really heard much of since. I think he's had a lot of involvement with NFL and other non-basketball sport But he said that Ralph Sampson was expected to play in this game, but he was a no-show. And then he also mentioned that Dominique Wilkins, of course, the Atlanta Hawks star, was rumoured to play, but nothing came of that either. So just a couple of interesting tidbits there, mate. I know that you're a big Dominique fan. Yes, massive fan of the human highlight film. And when you mentioned before about the the injury issues that Bill Walton had, which really affected his Hall of Fame career, it's very sad to see a guy like him who is as talented – uh, at both ends of the floor and as you mentioned before as a passing big man when you have a guy who's as, as talented as what he is cut down by injuries and then you have it's always disappointing to see a you know a much hyped big man come out out of college such as a Michael Oloa Candy or a Kawami Brown and if you have a look at their their stat lines from their NBA career they appeared as though their career was beset by injuries. Mm. A couple of uh, tumbleweed just went in front of me as you were talking there, mate, so it doesn't bode well for those two guys. I couldn't actually find much information on on this game in uh, Iowa, Adam. The actual 
statement on the official website of the Iowa Hawkeyes regarding this game says that the men's Olympic team faced an NBA all-star team and came away with a 92-79 win over the professionals. The Olympic team included Michael Jordan, Patrick Ewing, Sam Perkins, Chris Mullen and a young Steve Alford. The pro squad included former Hawkeyes, Ronnie Lester and Bobby Hansen. Other notable NBA players included Bill Walton, Danny Ainge, Clark Kellogg and Clyde Drexler. The NBA team held a 43-42 to halftime lead before the Olympians pulled away in a big second half. Bobby Hansen, mate, amongst those names you listed, of course, was a crucial part of that great comeback in Game 6 of the 1992 Finals where he was on fire as part of the bench crew that brought the Bulls back into the game while MJ sat on the bench. Bobby Hansen's NBA career was going was going into oblivion. I think at that point in time, he was a serviceable shooting guard. He actually appeared in a few three point shootouts at the All Star Weekend. He's now known for an iconic moment in Chicago Bulls history for that three pointer that he hit from the corner in the fourth quarter of Game Six of the 1992 NBA Finals. So I'm sure that he's happy that he had the opportunity to to both play with the Bulls and you know, have his own moment in NBA history like that. I've actually been in discussions via email with Bobby, and hopefully he will be a future guest of the In All Ennis podcast. So stay tuned for that one. But he also had. He had a very serviceable NBA career as a veteran, and in his earlier years, particularly when he was with the Utah Jazz, he was uh, more of an important figure as well on that Jazz team. So depending on the player and their fit with the franchise, they can definitely have more of an impact. So yeah, good stuff there from Bobby Hanson. Let's get into the fifth game, mate. This one was probably my personal favorite. It took place on July the 9th. It was at the newly built Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis, Indiana. Now, the USA went on to be 5-zip in the exhibition series with a 97-82 to victory over another NBA All-Star team. This one was very memorable for a number of reasons, but mostly it's remembered as the record-breaking attendance for the then-largest US crowd at a basketball game, which surpassed the 1982 NCAA final, which featured... Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing and James Worthy, amongst others, of course. Well, the crowd was 67,596, so just a monster crowd. Fantastic to watch. And in this game, coming off the bench, Chris Mullen led all scorers with 18 points. Uh, Sam Perkins had 14, MJ had 12, and Patrick Ewing had 11. So some nice, even balance of scoring again from Team USA. Just quickly for the NBA, and they had a great team for this game. No wonder, given the crowd and the fact that it was televised. Larry Bird of Boston, of course, had 14 points and five boards. Kevin McHale of the Celtics also had 13 points. You got players like Jim Paxson, who was with the Portland Trailblazers. He had 11 points. Isaiah Thomas of Detroit had 10 points and seven assists. And of course, given some of these guys I've just mentioned, mate, they have strong links to Indiana. The reception that they received from the home fans as well was definitely warranted and then some. A few more quick points. I have to make mention at this point, mate, here, I've got on my notes, Chris Mullen equals beast. Underrated when measured against the star players. I reckon he was he was just a fantastic player, even at this stage in his early career. Uh, he just hadn't even turned pro at this stage. He was one of the guys that actually went back for a further season at St. John's before turning pro. He was just a really reliable scorer, could really fill it up in a hurry, and was definitely underrated, and I even think still throughout his whole NBA career, as great a player as he was and a Hall of Famer, I think he's one of the more underrated players ever. Yeah, I would agree with what you've just said. He's one of the great sharpshooters in in league history, and one of the things that made him the great player that he was is he was a really, really smart basketball player, very, very crafty on the court. Couldn't agree more there. I'd love to have a chat to Chris Mullen in the future if we can ever land him as a guest on the podcast. It'd just be fantastic. Now, the NBA All-Stars coach was Kevin Lockery, who was the then Chicago Bulls coach, and he would coach Jordan in his first year as well in the pros. Him, along with Bobby Knight, both got technical fouls in this game as well. So you can't say that they weren't trying and they weren't trying to manipulate the teams and the officials for all of their worth. Uh, That was quite interesting to note as well. Um, on my notes here, I've got a comment that says, one of the most little-known games of such importance ever. Were you aware of this game prior to us doing this NB85 project? 
I had heard about it, but I honestly can't recall having seen any footage of it or reading any articles about it. So your assessment that it's such an important game in in like in basketball history is uh, is accurate. Mm. On July the 10th, there's an article which was titled US Olympic Basketball Team Becomes Part of a Game's History. And in the article it says, I think everyone wanted to be part of history tonight, said Bird, who led the NBA with 14 points. That's one reason I was here, to get a chance to play in my home state and also to get a chance to play in front of the largest crowd. You just can't pass something like that up. So I think that sort of sums things up very nicely there as well, mate. A small side note on the stat you mentioned before about the the other size of the crowd. The uh, the Guinness Book of Records uh, at the time actually listed a crowd at a 1951 Harlem Globetrotters game in West Berlin of 75,000 as the largest crowd ever to see a basketball game. Nice little useless fact for you and the listener. That's phenomenal. When you think about it, that's an incredible amount of people to witness a basketball game. In 1951. Yeah, exactly right. The other first thing that is a rude shock to the eyeballs in this game is that the other red and white striped warm-up pants that the US squad wore. <laughs> they were loud. They were very loud. And speaking of rude shock to the eyeballs, Larry Bird played the game with his spectacular bouffant haircut, and I think he had a bit of a, a five o'clock shadow, which is one of the first men I've ever seen with a blonde beard, uh, and said after the game that there's no doubt that they have picked the best basketball players in the college game for the US national team. As an NBA fan, my main exposure to Joe Klein was when he spent time with the Bulls in their second three-peat run, and I'd heard stories of his sense of humour. Uh, a fun moment from the warm-ups was Klein forcing the assistant coaches to high-five him instead of handshakes <laughs> like the other players uh, received from them. It looked to be uh, a light-hearted tone that the team had as a group. There was massive roars during the introduction for um, hometown heroes Steve Alford and Bobby Knight. Adam, you recently tweeted out a screenshot from the game of the starters for both teams quite an array of basketball talent. The USA started Jordan, Tisdale, Perkins, Robertson and Fleming, whilst the NBA team started Aguirre, Bird, Parrish, Isaiah and and Jim Paxson, two awesome starting lineups. There was a very heavy 1984 world champion Boston Celtics influence on the game with Larry Bird, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, Quinn Buckner and Jerry Seasting playing for the NBA team. And the highlight of this game, if anyone ever gets to it to see it, it's on YouTube, was a dunk that Michael Jordan did on Robert Reed and his Jerry curls in the second half. It was <laughs> it was an awesome dunk. Oh, fantastic dunk. And in the show notes to this episode, in allearnest.com slash NB85-3, in the notes there, I'll have a link to the YouTube clip of the game. There's about seven or eight minutes of highlights from this particular game, including Jordan's monster throwdown on Robert Reed and his curls. Yeah, incredible players that are on the NBA team here, but the USA still won by quite a comfortable margin. But yeah, just a fantastic game to watch, steeped in history with just all the different players who are taking part in this particular game. One notable omission was Magic Johnson, who played in an earlier exhibition game, but for whatever reason wasn't on the actual roster for this NBA team, which I thought he would have been an absolute lay-down bazaar. But anyhow, he wasn't on the team. Also good to have a Seasting sighting too, mate. I guess if you actually look at the way that Seasting's name is spelt, that's probably a bit funnier than it actually came across. Now, Always a bit of a challenge to um, spit the Seasting out. Yeah, it is. Yep. It's an existing problem when you have to go through those sort of names. Now, if we look at the sixth game of the exhibition schedule, mate, this one was on July the 12th. Team USA took on another NBA All-Star squad. It was at Greensboro Coliseum in Greensboro, North Carolina. So we're going back to Tar Heel country here. This game featured so many alums of North Carolina, it wasn't funny. The USA team won 96 to 85 Now, Michael Jordan, of course, you would expect him to step up in a game like this back in North Carolina. He scored 25 points on 10 of 19 shooting, had 19 points in the second half alone, and he also had eight rebounds just for good measure. Steve Alford was 7 of 10 from the field with 15 points of his own, and Sam Perkins, another North Carolina product, he had 12 points, as did Alvin Robertson, along with seven assists as well. So fantastic stuff. Now, for the NBA team, they had Kenny Carr, who was a top scorer, who, who was with the Portland Trailblazers at that stage. He had 16 points, 
Thurl Bailey of the Utah Jazz had 15. Walter Davis, another NBA legend, another NBA great. <laughs> I've given him legend status. That's probably a little bit too far over the top. Um, I should have said Davis, a North Carolinian legend, uh, was also part of the team. He was with Phoenix in the NBA at that stage. Him and Sleepy Floyd of the Golden State Warriors, they scored 13 points apiece. James Worthy from the LA Lakers and Frank Johnson of the Washington Bullets also had 12 points apiece for the NBA players. So USA had an 11-point win. Uh, the NBA All-Stars were coached by Billy Cunningham and the USA team were up by 12 points at the half and they still maintain a pretty similar margin at the end of the game. As I did mention, the NBA roster had very interesting ties to the UNC program, uh, including Phil Ford, who was with the Houston Rockets, Walter Davis, as we mentioned, uh, James Worthy, of course, and Bobby Jones, who was with Philadelphia 76ers. So a real treat for the fans in North Carolina who got to see some of their favorite players over an extended period of time from multiple generations, you'd have to say too. I never realized how highly regarded Frank Johnson was as a player earlier on in his career. My main memory of him as a Bulls fan is, of course, that wonderful air ball that he put up at the end of game <laughs> six of the, of the other 93 final. So, yeah, I was actually quite surprised to try to see him play in a number of these exhibition games. One thing that I noticed, Adam, that you probably would have as well was the whole way through these articles was Bobby Knight continually praising the cooperation of the NBA Players Association in getting his squad ready for the games. Yeah, I did notice that. And in a couple of the games I've seen on DVD, he does take a moment out either before a game or after a game to get the microphone out and do a quick little shout out to the crowd and thank them publicly as well for their support along with as you said the nba players association so that's pretty cool as well that he had the wherewithal to actually acknowledge them at the time that this was happening as well an article that appeared on july the 13th which is titled jordan paces olympians win says after the game and this just elaborates further knight took the microphone and said the team would do everything possible to win the gold medal the crowd then began chanting usa usa I guess playing against so many guys who played at North Carolina added some incentive, Jordan said as well in the same article, which was probably part of the reason why he lit it up for 25 points back home in North Carolina. Another article on the 13th of July by The Telegraph entitled Michael Jordan Leads Olympians said that the US team were 6-0 at this point in the exhibition series and Billy Cunningham, who coached the NBA team in the previous game, said that they've had some great spurts of basketball but doesn't want them to get a false sense of security that the teams that they play in the Olympics have all played together for a long time. Uh, It also spoke of MJ's 46% slump up to this point and how his improved play may be the improvement phase for the team. Uh, Again, funny, in 2014, to see a player shooting 46% being considered as a slump in 2014, 46% would lead the NBA. Kenny Carr, who won gold in 1976, said that his Olympic team was was better, but also said that MJ makes the 84 team great and wouldn't want to see the outcome if they didn't have him. So he definitely had an impact uh, on the NBA players that he was playing against in the exhibitions. And Bobby Jones, the 76ers legend, also said in another article that Jordan was by far their most important player. I'd agree with all of that as well. The game in Greensboro actually featured on a famous cover of Sports Illustrated on July 23rd, 1984, entitled Up Up for LA. No one player at this point on the Olympic squad was getting a lot of playing time. Uh, MJ was leading the squad in minutes at 21.2 per game. US coach Bobby Knight moved MJ to Ford for the game, to which MJ commented that, and I quote, I'm getting adjusted to it. I'm playing against a lot bigger guys. I have a little advantage with my quickness. Yeah, understatement of the year, saying he had a little advantage. But I think I'd also read in some of the articles that MJ was starting to front some of the big guys down low, and he was sometimes getting caught out by the fact they'd lob it over the top, but definitely had plenty of quickness there. I mentioned to you just recently after having watched uh, a fair bit of MJ from the 80s that when the late 80s, early 90s came and he had had enough of the the, the beatings from the Pistons and he decided to uh, bulk his body up a little bit, 
I asked your opinion if you thought that in doing that, he maybe lost a bit of that electric quickness that he had in the 80s. I know that by the time the, the 90s rolled around that you know, he was up towards his, his 30s in age. But just after watching some clips of, of, of some games from the 80s, he was just a freakish athlete with his quickness. Like His hang time was just you know, at its peak in the other late 80s. And I just wondered if like the extra weight might have just slowed him down a smidge, even though like, he was still a killer in the 90s. Yeah, good comparison because he was just cat quick, just ridiculous in the 80s. There's no doubt about that. So I think you make a very valid point there, no doubt, mate. Another article from July the 13th was titled, Night Influence is Evidence. And the article suggests that there would be no national TV coverage. Therefore, the NBA roster would be weaker for the forthcoming exhibition game. There was a little subheading which said Dunleavy added to NBA team. Now, at the time, he was a free agent who had just finished the 84 season with the Bucks, and he replaced Ricky Green, who was with the Utah Jazz, but pulled out of this game due to injury. Now, there's also a classic photo from this July 13 game, and I think I even tweeted it out recently via Twitter, as you do with most tweets. The photo shows Mike Dunleavy fouling Michael Jordan, who is attacking the basket, and Dunleavy's hand completely covers Jordan's line of sight. So it probably would have hurt too, to say to say the least. I've never seen footage of the actual play, but just by the photo itself, it looks awfully painful. I'd never seen that photo uh, before either. It is a, a pearl of a photo. And in Australian rules football parlance, you'd call it a, a coat hanger. That's what it looks like in the photo. The seventh game of the exhibition series was on July 13. And this time it was at Milwaukee Arena, as we just inferred with that article we were talking about. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the USA team was 6-0 and heading into this seventh game. And Chris Mullen, again, was the top scorer for the US with 18 points in a 94-78 to win. Alvin Robertson had 13 points and MJ had 12. And for the NBA team, Terry Cummings of the San Diego Clippers and Quentin Daly, who was with the Chicago Bulls at the time, along with Wes Matthews, who was currently a free agent at that stage, all had 15 points apiece. There's also a an article that was July 17th. It was titled, Knight's Brash Courtside Manor is No Accident. Knight actually said, Hey, I don't want kids hurt. We have too much in this. Do I want one of those kids hurt because some idiot can't officiate? <laughs> I don't want that done. Not here. But after Vern Fleming, the Olympian from the University of Georgia, was charged with what appeared to be a routine offensive foul, Knight rose from his chair in the Milwaukee arena, moved along the sideline toward midcourt, and gestured to Michael Jordan, who happened to be holding the basketball. Jordan, who appreciates a smart pass when he sees one, followed directions and tossed the ball to his coach. That is when Knight demonstrated the fundamental truth behind the US effort to regain the gold medal that had been given up in the boycott of 1980. It's his ball. The article continues on detailing how Knight's temper just continued to get away from him, and you had a little bit more to follow up on about that. The play where MJ got hit by Dunleavy, the one that we spoke about just before, going to the basket, and MJ also ended up with a bloody nose on the play. It showed the hot-headedness of, of Bobby Knight. He was already upset about the officiating, uh, and on this play, he got tossed after. He wouldn't give the ball back to the refs. The, the ball actually it rolled over to him, and he picked it up, and the, the refs asked for it back, and he wouldn't give it to him. So they threw him out of the game. The Jordan and Dunleavy incident led to a confrontation between the two, also getting into it a little bit during that game at one point was was Danny Shays and, and Patrick Ewing. This showed that the games were, were very intense. Atlanta rookie and Marquette star Glenn Doc Rivers played for the NBA team. And amazingly enough, there was no TV coverage of the game. On the 27th of July, on a completely different topic, Sam Bowie declared, and I quote, I'm sound that area of the leg won't be injured again. The bone graft is like welding two pieces of metal together. And he then said in a later column, I just didn't have the desire and motivation I feel I needed to make the team. This is in regards to the fact that himself and his Kentucky teammate Mel Turpin both declined invitations to the the other trials. And uh, I'd mentioned in an early episode that maybe it was, it was Sam Bowie not wanting to put himself out there, his leg problems in case he hurt himself and compromised his draft status. And 
reading back on these now, you know, I kind of feel a little bit more vindicated in my point of view on that. What do you think? You've raised some fair points there, and it was definitely one of the things he was trying to say was to try and create a diversion of sorts, I guess, and stop the questioning about his physical ability. But of course, unfortunately for all concerned, it came back to haunt him in numerous seasons where he was never really at the level of what people expected him to be based on how he said he was pre-draft and uh, in the lead up to his rookie season. So it's a pretty sad story overall. But we did mention briefly in the previous episode, I think it was, that the great documentary about Bowie and his transition from Kentucky into the NBA and then all of his injury troubles and whatnot called Going Big. That was really a fantastic doco. So I suggest that you do have a look at it if you haven't already watched it. Once that seventh game had ended, the USA was still a perfect 7-0 and record. They then had almost a week off before the eighth and second last game of the exhibition tour on July the 21st when they headed to Memorial Coliseum in Phoenix, Arizona. That was a game against another team of NBA All-Stars. Jordan had a fantastic offensive performance in this game. He was 9 of 14 from the field for 27 points. Sam Perkins had 16 points and 7 boards. And the NBA team were led by Walter Davis, who was with the Phoenix Suns. So good to see the hometown player there getting some good points. Uh, Alex English of the Denver Nuggets with 12 points. And Larry Nance, also of the Phoenix Suns at that stage, with 11 points as well. And the head coach for the NBA All-Stars in this particular game was the LA Lakers, Pat Riley. And this is one of these exhibition games that has a uh, an 8 minute and 44 second highlight clip on YouTube. Uh, so I urge anyone who wants to, to have a look at what turned out to be MJ's highest scoring game in the uh, exhibitions. And it's just you know, a really good snapshot of what MJ was like at this age and what he was like playing against the NBA teams. Bobby Knight said that he'd had questions about MJ beforehand, but it was at this point that Knight proclaimed that he's going to be the greatest damn basketball player that ever lived. Now, how good does that make Bobby Knight look? It does. That he came out with that statement. Great stuff from Bobby Knight. The commentators were rightfully gushing during the game. Billy Packer, who was on the call of the game, said that Jordan had a chance to be on the same level with Jerry West and Oscar Robertson as an all-time great of the game and a Hall of Fame player. He also said that there's no limit to what Jordan can do, which, again, Bobby Knight made himself look like a genius with his comment, as did Billy Packer with these. At the time, it was a massive call on a player who'd never played an NBA game, but also in hindsight, not exactly drawing a long bow. Packer also mentioned how it took ACC refs a year to get used to MJ's quick first step in Michael Jordan, the life. Roland Lazenby spoke of Dean Smith's anguish over the traveling calls that Mike was incorrectly getting. They actually sent tapes to the NCAA to show them that they were wrong on the calls, which is incredible that a team had to send tapes just so the NCAA look at it, could see what was actually happening. That's how fast his first step was. He also mentioned during the game that Jordan and Elijah won are two of the best that he has seen in making it from offense to defense on the court. Pat Riley, who was coaching the NBA team, said MJ was as gifted a player as I've ever seen play. And U.S. coach Bobby Knight was critical of the officiating in the Milwaukee game, as we mentioned before. And he said that he hopes that we don't have another, and I quote, officiating abortion Mm. like they did in Milwaukee. He thought the physical play, which ended in 74 personal fouls being called, was the refs simply losing control of the game. Yeah, that's a staggering number of fouls when you think about it in the course of a a game. And yeah, that's some very strong words to say the least from Bobby Knight about the officiating too. So pretty, pretty rank description to be honest. But uh, (laughs) I guess at the time you can get away with uh, saying that sort of stuff. But these days, perhaps not. And it's fair to say that Bobby Knight, Billy Packer, uh, Pat Riley, I think was the other guy you mentioned, who all were pretty much quite prophetic in their words about Jordan and the impact that he would have on the game. He was just starting to dominate these Team USA versus NBA games. And this was the second game where he'd scored 25 plus points in the exhibitions against the NBA stars. So this is where he's really starting to, I guess, click within the Team USA and become their dominant leader. The US won the game 84 to 72, just out of interest. And they were 8 and 0 as they headed to San Diego for the final ninth game in the tour. That game in San Diego took place on July the 25th, only three or four days before the Olympics commenced in Los Angeles. 
The final game was at the San Diego Sports Arena in San Diego, California, and USA would again win to have a clean sweep against the NBA team. They had a, a hard-fought 91-86 to victory, and Sam Perkins was the leading scorer this time for USA with 17 points. MJ had 16, and 14 of which were in the second half. For the NBA team, Kiki Vandewey of the Portland Trailblazers had 15 points, and Rolando Blackman from the Dallas Mavericks had 14 just a couple of quick notes from the game. The US were leading 40 to 39 at the half, so they still hung on to win by five after the second half had concluded. And the coach of the NBA All Stars in this occasion was Jim Lynham. An article from July 26, which was titled Carolina Twosome Decisive. One of my favourite descriptions of play from the entire exhibition series that we've covered in this episode, mate. It says the NBA pulled to within 78 76 with six minutes left but Jordan hit from the baseline. Following a reverse drive by the Clippers' Terry Cummings that brought the crowd of 12,347 San Diegans from their seats, Jordan finished the job by connecting from the baseline and then used his left hand for a reverse scoop that was part ballet and part space shuttle. Now, I absolutely love that quote and was just thrilled to see that in amongst all the articles that we've researched for this chat. So that was one of my highlights in terms of finding bits and pieces from the articles. I was curious as to whether or not at the point in time when when Terry Cummings was able to finish the reverse drive that brought the 12,000 San Diegans from their seats, you know, Terry Cummings at the time being a San Diego clipper, mm-hmm. this must have been just before the time that he wouldn't mind that Terry Cummings had said that he wouldn't mind a trade from the Clippers. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fair chance that they wouldn't have been cheering for him a great deal on a layup if they had have known that. Yeah, I think they're, I'm sorry to steal your thunder a bit there, mate, probably for the <laughs> second time in this episode, but I do remember from the previous episode how you said Terry Cummings, quote, wouldn't mind being traded from the Clippers. So, Wouldn't mind a trade. Yeah, that's a, yes. a disturbing little note there. But yeah, I guess the fans may have reacted differently. So that concluded the exhibition series and USA were 9-0. and That almost brings an end to this particular episode. And our next episode will focus exclusively on the Olympic Games themselves as we talk about each of the different games that US played en route to the gold medal. And you just have a couple of closing comments you'd like to make, mate, before we round this one out. Adam, until now, I can't recall having seen much of the 84 Olympic Games footage, which is what we're going to be covering in our next episode, episode four, unless it was on a video like Come Fly With Me. Uh, I've since taken some time to watch some of what YouTube has to offer on the topic. And to be able to watch it is as essentially new footage has been awesome. MJ's move from UNC into the pros and all that it entailed, including the 84 Olympic Games, is really legendary stuff. And being able to chronicle it and put it into a podcast yeah, has been great fun. As I mentioned, yeah, we are still to hit the really good stuff in MJ's rookie season with the Bulls. I couldn't agree with you more, mate. And yeah, really exciting times ahead. If you're enjoying what you've heard so far in the first three episodes, feel free to hit us up on Twitter or via the Facebook page or add a comment to the blog post, which is just simply at inallairness.com with any suggestions or things that you want to actually hear covered in future episodes to do with the rookie season or the Olympic Games themselves or whatever it may be. But Please spread the word if you're enjoying it. We'd love to get more people out there who we know are also fans of this era who would really probably love this type of podcast series. So thanks to all those who have been promoting the show. We really do appreciate it. Simply hashtag NB85. And by checking that link on Twitter and also via Facebook, I've been using it a bit as well, you'll see a great stream of great photos. And particularly, Aaron, you've been posting some fantastic photos from MJ's rookie season that have been very rare. I haven't actually seen some of them before as well. So that's certainly worth checking out as well, I'd suggest. I also hope that the other listeners are enjoying the new and improved MB85. I was able to drop some of my hard-earned on some hardware and uh, hopefully the other sound quality is uh, is coming across as something akin to John Law's morning show. (laughs) Thank you, by the way, for shelling out for that because I think the new microphone does improve the audio markedly i appreciate it so i'm sure the listener will appreciate it too hopefully you're also appreciating all of the other funds that i'm pouring into the podcast as well via my purchases on on amazon (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I do appreciate it, mate. I've almost got three dollars to be able to rub together. <laughs> so I do appreciate all the effort that you are putting in, mate, behind the scenes. Thanks again, and uh, I look forward to chatting with you more in episode four, where we detail the '84 Olympic Games themselves. Giddy up! Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at inallairness. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash inallairness. Join me next time for another edition of the show.